In this video, we're going to explain what disk margin is, why it might be a better representation of how much margin your system has over something like classical gain and phase margins, and how to interpret the results. For example, given this system L, the classical gain and phase margins are 4.5 and almost 37 degrees. But if I check the disk margins, they're, well, there's a bunch of numbers here, but they're definitely different, and that's what we're going to talk about. But don't worry, we're not going to get too bogged down in the mathematics. We're going to try to interpret disk margin and these numbers visually. So I hope you stick around for it. I'm Brian, and welcome to a MATLAB Tech Talk. Let's say that we have a system model which we'll call L. L represents the open loop response of the real plant and any controllers and filters that are in line with it. So it's the open loop response of the ideal system that you want to implement. And as we discussed in the last video, this model won't perfectly match the real system. Therefore, we want to make sure there's margin in the design. Margin is a way to specify how much uncertainty your system can handle before it no longer meets the requirement. And specifying margin in terms of gain and phase, like gain margin must be greater than 3, and phase margin must be greater than 30 degrees, means that your real system will still be stable, even if its gain is 3 times higher than the model at the critical frequency, or if its phase differs from the model by 30 degrees at the critical frequency. Our system, L, meets those requirements, since we saw that it has a gain margin of 4.5 and a phase margin of 37 degrees. So this seems good. If it didn't meet the requirement, then we would need to change L, either the controller part, or the filters, or maybe even the plant itself. And the more margin that you have in the design, then the more robust the system is to uncertainty and variations. And therefore, the more confidence you're going to have that the real system will be stable. We can assess how much margin our closed loop system has by adding some variation in line with L. And the amount of variation that it takes for the closed loop system to go unstable is how much margin we have in that direction. And for this discussion, we're going to vary a combination of both gain and phase. And we're going to do that by multiplying the plant by a value f. The multiplier f is just a single complex number, so it has a real and imaginary component. And the value of this two-dimensional number dictates how much gain and phase we're adding to the plant. And we can see this more easily if we plot the value of f on a complex plane. Gain is the magnitude of the complex number, or the distance from the origin. And phase is the angle between the real line and the line connecting the origin to the number. So if f equals 4 minus 3i, this has a magnitude, or a multiplier of 5. And it adds an angle of about negative 37 degrees. So it's going to cause every frequency in the system to lag by 37 degrees and have a magnitude 5 times larger. And we can check this out in MATLAB. I have the transfer function L, and I've created a multiplier, f equals 4 minus 3i. And now I'll plot the Bode plot for both L and f times L. And check this out. L is the blue line, and the modified f times L has been raised by 14 decibels, which is 5 times larger, and the phase has been lowered by about 37 degrees. So by multiplying our open loop model by a complex number, we have a way to conveniently add phase and gain. Now we have to note that just multiplying a transfer function by a single complex number typically results in something that isn't a realizable system, since it has an imaginary term in it. But that's okay. This is just a tool for us to use to figure out the limits within our system. Now, Bode plots are nice because gain and phase are separated out, and it's pretty easy to see the added gain or the added phase directly. However, disk margins have a nice intuitive interpretation in the complex plane, so from now on, we're going to look at our system response on a Nyquist plot rather than a Bode plot. All right, on the screen, there's two graphs. The one on the left is plotting just the multiplier f in the complex plane. And you can see that it's currently at f equals 1. And the plot on the right shows the Nyquist plot for f times l. But since f equals 1, this is just the response for the unmodified system. Now, I'm not going to go through the Nyquist stability criterion in this video, but if you're interested, I've linked to one of my videos below that describes it in detail. 
And if you're not familiar with it, then I think it's enough to know that for this particular open loop system L, the closed loop system will be unstable if the Nyquist curve encircles the point minus one. The plot is green if the closed loop system is stable, and then it's gonna turn red when it goes unstable. So when we add gain and phase to the system by changing the value of F, as long as this curve doesn't cross over the minus one point, or as long as it doesn't turn red, then the closed loop system is stable with those variations. In general, that statement's not exactly true, but for this system, it is. Again, check out the linked video if you want to learn more. So we can see that our closed loop system is stable without any variation in gain or phase since the curve doesn't encircle minus one. But watch what happens to this Nyquist curve when I add gain. You can see that the curve grows as gain increases and it shrinks when gain decreases. But the thing to note here is that there's this one point at f equals 4.5 where the curve crosses the minus one point, which means that the closed loop system is not stable for this variation. This is the value of the classical gain margin that we calculated at the beginning of this video. So gain can vary up to 4.5 times larger in our real system without causing instability. And phase is similar. We can add pure phase by varying f along the unit circle. So the magnitude stays one, but the angle is changing. And adding phase into the system has this folding effect on the Nyquist plot, where the top and bottom halves circle towards each other to the left. And the angle of rotation is equal to the angle of added phase. Again, there's this one point at about minus 37 degrees where the curve crosses the minus one point. This is, again, what we calculated for the classical phase margin. Now, what we've done is vary gain or phase individually. But if we look at the possible values of the multiplier f, you can see that we've only looked at a very small region of the entire complex plane. Specifically, this line where only gain is adjusted and this line where only phase is adjusted. So the question is, is our system robust to other variations? All of these other combinations of phase and gain. Well, let's try a few. We can check f equals 1.13 minus 0.65i, which is equivalent to a gain of 1.3 and a rotation of negative 30 degrees. In this combination, it's not stable. And we could try another point, f equals 1.36 minus 0.34i, and see that this is closed loop stable. Or point f equals 2.95 minus 0.52i, and see that it's not stable. Now, rather than checkpoints one at a time, we can use a computer to try hundreds of variations and color the points red that cause instability and green that don't. And we get something like this. Remember, margin is how much variation a system can tolerate in any direction. So starting from the nominal system, f equals one, we can say that this system can vary up to 4.5 in gain and 37 degrees in phase. But as we can see from this plot, the story of how robust our system is to variation is a lot more nuanced than just looking at classical gain and phase margins. This is where the idea of disk margin comes in. As the name suggests, disk margin defines margin as a disk in the complex plane rather than just two points. We can define a disk that is able to fit entirely within the stable region and includes the nominal point f equals one. Within this disk, every single combination of gain and phase produces a stable closed loop system. So now we can say that the margin in our design is the distance between the nominal system and the edge of the disk. So as long as the real system variation falls within this disk, then you have confidence that it's gonna be stable. And this is nice because it takes into account a combination of phase and gain rather than just one or the other like we had with classical margins. The size and location of the disk is defined as a function of two parameters, E and alpha. E is the skew of the disk, and you can think of that as how far off the center of the disk is relative to the point f equals one. And you can think of alpha as a measure of the size of the disk. So if we choose a value for skew, then alpha is just the maximum disk size that only includes stable variations. So it's the largest circle that only has green inside of it. Now, the value of E that you choose is based on your expectation of how gain in the real system is going to vary. If you think gain in the real system is more likely to be higher than what your model claims, 
you may want to choose a more positive E. And if you think the gain's going to be lower than what your model claims, you may want to choose a more negative E. And if you think the gain is equally likely to be higher or lower, or you just have no idea, then you may want to choose E equals zero. This balances the gain equally on either side of F equals one. And we can now describe the boundary of this maximum disk as having a lower and upper gain margin and a lower and upper phase margin. Or we could say that given a specific skew, E, the maximum disk margin is alpha. And remember, changing the skew, say by making it larger, moves the disk in a way that increases both the upper and lower gain margins since it moves the disk to the right. And for this system, L, it also lowers the phase margins. And again, you'd choose a more positive skew if you thought that the real system was more likely to have higher gain than what your model has. Now if we revisit the numbers that we got from the disk margin command in MATLAB, you can see that each of these disk parameters are there. There's the upper and lower gain margin, the upper and lower phase margin, and the disk margin alpha. These are the values for E equals zero, since that's the default in this command. But we can run it again with E equals five, and see that they are all slightly different. Both the upper and lower gain margins are higher, and the phase margins are lower, just as we expected. All right, going back to this graph, it makes it seem like disk margin is really conservative since it's excluding all of these stable variations that are outside of the disk. For example, we know a magnitude increase of three is a stable variation, but looking at the disk margin, we're gonna claim that it's outside of what our system can handle. But this might not be as conservative as you think, because even though a gain of three is stable, in that condition, it doesn't take very much phase shift to cause an instability. So the system may be stable with this much uncertainty in gain, but there isn't much wiggle room for uncertainty in phase. Therefore, it's not terribly conservative to just claim that a gain of three is not a variation that you're comfortable with. But it might be worthwhile to check both disk margin and gain and phase margins of your system because they're going to tell you slightly different things. And, you know, it's interesting to see if they're very different from each other. We can tell that this system is pretty robust to phase variations, even when combined with some gain variation, since the two techniques produce similar phase margins. But if we look at a different system, this one where L is this fourth order transfer function that I created, you can see that the stability map for this system produces this concave shape. And this results in a huge difference between classical margins, which are infinite in gain and about 70 degrees in phase, and the disk margins, which are much, much smaller. This tells us that our system is very robust to pure phase or pure gain variations, but not very robust to combinations of gain and phase. Now, overall margin is just a design tool. It's a way to ensure that your design is robust to the variations and uncertainty that you're expecting in the real system. And you can set those requirements as classical gain and phase margins, or as disk margin, or as both of them. The important thing is that you understand what those margins are telling you and what their limitations are. And if your system doesn't meet your margin requirements, then you have to find a way to change your design. Now, you may be thinking that this transfer function's a bit contrived and real systems don't typically have this type of extreme difference between gain and phase and disk margin, so what's the big deal? Well, even if that statement is true, one of the huge benefits of looking at disk margin and why it's important to understand is that it's a much better indication of robustness when we apply it to multivariable systems. And that's what we're gonna cover in the next video. So if you don't want to miss that or any future Tech Talk videos, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. And if you want to check out my channel, Control System Lectures, I cover more control theory topics there as well. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.